call the work session today uh, forward to order, if we could please. And the first item on the agenda is modification of the handicap flag policy. Carol Long. Come up. I just want to remind everybody that uh, Chris is over there. Maybe Chris, you could wave everybody. He's uh, recording this meeting and it will be uh, live streamed. Uh, he's, he has a new desk uh, to make it more efficient to accomplish that goal. Carol, you're up. Want me to talk into the mic? Yes, please. Go to turn it off. Uh, All right. Testing. That'll work. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, good morning, all. Um, the current handicap flag policy is what we're looking at, making an adjustment and test policy for 2019. Currently, as it stands, the, the handicap flag policy is limited to customers with state driver's license that have handicap disabilities. It was utilized by about 15 people for the last six months. We're looking at doing something different in 2019. It was brought to us by a member for our aged population that are struggling to get out of the golf courses. What the new policy includes, it is a test. Um, it's just gonna allow customers over the age of 80 that they feel they need the ability to get closer to the greens or the tee boxes to apply for a flag license. What that is, is they come in, they show their driver's license, they get a little, little card, they come in the day they choose to use it, whether it be at Highlands or Golf Course, they turn that in with their driver's license, they are then allowed to use a handicap flag to get around the golf courses. It is over the age of 80. That is something we're going to try this year. We proposed this to the JAC, it was voted on, yes, we're bringing it to you to try it. This system, will, this policy will only be in place from April 1st to October 31st. That is something in the growing season, so it's summer. It's not gonna hurt our golf courses. Mr. Keith Imes is behind it, and so is the rest of my staff. Any questions on that? You did say 15 people have used it. Currently 15 have used it in 2018. We don't feel it's gonna be overwhelmed. We're just trying to help our age population. Okay, so those 15 people can use their flag year round. Correct. And so the new people will be only October, or April through October. Correct. Okay. It's just a little, uh, little stuff, and, and on this policy, it's going to follow all the stipulations that was determined last year. 30 feet from the green, 30 feet from the tee box, cards on path, you're not allowed to use the flags. If this is abused by our membership, we will have to pull it back. So we've got to look after our product that we provide for our membership. Did we ever have a situation where somebody didn't pick up their license again or anything like that? We had to contact? No. Okay. No. So it's not a matter of keeping something? No. Okay. And we felt one thing came up in our JSC meeting was, do we give them the flags for the year? They come in, they check it, they take it. What's going to happen with that is, I, if I have in the back of my truck, I can give it to somebody else and there's no control. This way, if they check in, if they choose to use it, it's not, if you're over 80, you need to use this. This is just if you have a disability, getting around, you struggle on days, certain golf courses, that's where this is going to benefit them. They can come in for the day, check in, get the card, return it so we keep control at each location. <coughs> and we have enough flags down to cover it, in your opinion? Yes. Actually, we got ahead of the game and last year. We thought that the handicap policy was going to be used by a lot of, lot of people and it really didn't. We only had 15, so we bought in early. So we feel that this would be a good good perk for the people to play golf over the age of 80. That's true. Any concerns? So, uh, <coughs> at the uh, golf uh, GAC meeting, uh, I asked the question of, um, and, and um, that the question still remains. Uh, in the fourth line of the policy, it says this is a summer program that will run, summer, a test summer program that will run from April 1st through October 31st. And David kindly pointed out that that, that was the time period. But it does say that that's a time period for the te test program. program. Uh, the start, of, or the delay of the start from, to, from today to April 1st, it was my understanding that that was to, uh, being done 
because winter conditions uh, would show more wear and tear on the fairways. Correct. What, what we have on our golf course <coughs> is, is Bermuda grass. It doesn't grow right now, and if you actually get out there with the rain we have, it's pretty thin out there. So we, Keith and I visited, we felt that this would be a growth program start in May, that Bermuda starts popping in. This won't damage the product we have out there for our customers. Okay, so my question is, uh, I can understand that delay, but does that mean that if it's successful, that going forward, it would only allow the new policy to be in place during the months of April through October? Going forward, not like if it, let's say it's successful and everybody likes it, then next year, are we going to end it in October and not start it up again until April? And, and keep that winter period uh, reserved for only people with, with handicapped. Uh, well, what we'll do, uh, is, that's a good question, uh, we'll look at the usage of it. You know, we don't know where this is going to go, whether we have 100 people sign up or we have 30 people sign up. We have 30 people sign up and we have a good winter, good growing season. Yeah. When we roll through November, Keith and I will visit, look at it and say, okay, we have 30 people sign up. Is this going to hurt our product? Okay. It's not going to hurt our product. We maybe stretch it. If we have 120 people and we have a bad summer, something goes on, we've got to look at that. You know, if we give up a product that Keith works so hard to give to our membership and our customers, I don't want to give that up as well. But we, we, it will, this is our test. Right. Right. So okay. We can definitely visit at the end of summer and see what we are. On that. Okay. Thank you very much. That good clarification. Uh, are you aware of there are two golf seasons according to groups, etc., that the winter group is now in effect? They start in October and they end in April or the first of the end of uh, March. And yes, then the I summer am. group starts in the end. So it kind of coincides with the groups as well yeah. as the course conditions. Well, but, but still, um, uh, it, it, Mike, it, the, the concern that was expressed is that since uh, it would be pre-growing season, there may be maybe more damage uh, if it's widely used during the winter. And so I, I just, Daryl's clarification that they'll re-examine the situation at the end and determine the extent of the, of the uh, time period in which it will be effective is a good one. So. Any other questions or concerns? We don't vote on this. It's policy. Or we do vote. No, we no. don't have to vote. But we just kind of want a consensus to make sure that everybody's in agreement that this is good. Everybody in agreement? Okay. I want to thank the board for listening to us and the member that came forward, Mr. Bill King, brought it to us. Shows we listen and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. I appreciate the GAC for taking it on. Thank you. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, next up on the agenda, we uh, I was approached by a property owner that uh, wanted us to uh, expand the statistical reporting that we provide on uh, the POA's website. And so what we plan on doing is uh, at next month's meeting presenting some draft uh, new statistical, statistical reports uh, for the board to consider uh, and to determine if we want to implement those. So I just want, to, want the board to be aware that uh, we're trying to accommodate uh, this request. It appears to be a reasonable request. Uh, from there. Questions or comments? Tom, I've got one uh, question on that. So we provide the information uh, to the public um, and they have the rightful access to that. What about their representation of that information, uh, whether they break it out in their own graphical uh, look and see? I know we, we provide just raw data, oftentimes just the spreadsheet. So. Um, I don't know if there's anything uh, that we have in place or that we're thinking about. So if I was to take that information, I was a member and I was to make it into a different bar graph or a different pie chart or a different type of graphical presentation of that information, um, and then that is disseminated um, throughout. I think, we'll, I think what we're seeing on the request for this is because people want to make a better judgment on the financial being of the POA. And so, with what I've witnessed out there in the public is that they're taking these numbers 
and they're trying to make their own analysis by them and then presenting them in new ways. So we may have some sort of, I don't know if we can have check and balance on this. We obviously can't control or we can maybe attempt to ask to verify if somebody wants to represent these numbers in a new graphical way or we may pursue different ways that we can provide options to look at those same numbers past the raw spreadsheet so we can somewhat meet them in the middle on that because that's where I think a lot of people struggle because not everybody learns um, and, and to view the, the statistics that way and that's why they came up with the pie chart that's why they came up with the bar graph so and it's only getting more progressive with the onset of infographics so we should think about how to make sure that we deliver that information so it's clear to many types of learners on how it's presented, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's a real good point. Um, you, you, can't, you, you can't control how someone's going to interpret the information, but also I don't think that hiding the information is, is the answer. Um, if I could um, offer, though, that um, if, if there is a situation, for instance, uh, John Nuttall uh, brought up uh, a disparity in a number that was grow, seemed to be growing artificially or without explanation. And I would suggest that what we do is when we, when we have these situations, if we're going to release the data, if there are situations where that occurs, that we asterisk the, the data and uh, have a have a reference to a footnote that says uh, the, the disparity caused between this and this is is due to a very simple explanation, not a large amount of detail. But it, in the case of, of John's stuff, uh, Tom, you responded and gave him a, a good explanation of what had happened. I can just see that happening with other people. You know that there is a perfectly understandable explanation for the, the data variations and yet at the same time without being privy to the reason for that that people may draw false conclusions and so it would be a good idea if, if there are instances like that where they are informed of the reason I think if you look at how the um, the rounds report has has evolved in a short amount of time where the board had asked us to ask management to put together a, a rounds report and then within a month or two then they, the board came back and said why don't you add some clarifying context yes. to it um, which called out you know look at this number is up or this number is down and this is why um, so I think that's kind of what you're talking about yes um, and so I, I think what we do is let's de develop the, the draft version of just the numbers themselves and then maybe maybe the second iteration is where we take it to the next level and provide some, some yeah, that'd be great. explanation. Uh, yeah. But I don't want to start doing the whole, you know, let, let, let's get let's get step one completed and then we'll work on step two, almost like what we did with the, the golf report. Right. And you could just publish the raw numbers and if uh, if issues are raised, uh, uh, how much attention any individual members is paying to those numbers will be uh, cause for giving fuller explanation, you know, but let's not just jump into it where we try to answer all the questions to begin with. I think that's a great point. And we have analytics on our website where we can see where, where um, what is more popular and less popular. Right. Um, you know, I, I remember last year we pulled up that only 50 people uh, had clicked on our budget. I thought that was a fairly low number, um, but uh, you know, clearly, you know, are we going to invest a huge amount of time on something that's receiving very limited attention? I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, next, uh, Doug's going to talk about three modifications to our uh, policy. Three different policies, actually, two modifications and one new policy. So, I'll have to take uh, Pat approached me several months ago about a concern that he had with our um, board member director removal procedure, and really there was it was lacking. 
Um, so he and I have worked for several months to, to kind of put something together that we could present to the Rules and Recs Committee. And um, that really, we didn't really have a very good process for, for removal of a, of, a, of a director if there was an issue. And also there was really nothing in there that talked about uh, discipline of a, of a director if that was wanted. So we, um, we put together an, a change, uh, policy 1.10 previously had you know, the outline of, of how that removal process was to take place. So I felt like it deserved its own policy, so I removed part of 1.10 and, and added something, uh, another statement there. Um, but took part of 1.10 and created a new policy 1.12 which is now called a disciplinary procedure for directors. So it's not just removal, but it also covers disciplinary procedures, including removal. Um, so if you read 1.10 and 1.12 in, in concert with each other, those, uh, those policies now will reflect uh, what we feel like is a good, um, a good procedure now, step-by-step -step procedure for a disciplinary process for directors if that should happen. Um, and we we presented that to the Rules and Regs Committee. Um, Jim, if you want to give an update, we had uh, a couple of meetings on that, had some changes, went back and forth and had changes, and I believe it was the recommendation of the, of the Rules and Regs to bring it forward to the, to the full board. Yeah, we sure did. We had Not yet. We, uh, we had two rules and regulation committee meetings uh, recently, and we're opposing this, really, uh, we did have four of the board members uh, in attendance, three on the committee and one also attended. And we, what we're asking the board, full board to do now is look at this draft and help finalize so that we can, we can begin the process of the readings very quickly, whether that happens at next week's meeting or not. But I invite each of the board members to, to look at the draft that uh, Rules and Regulations Committee has adopted. And, and also we, we looked at policy 6.02 regarding disclosure of information, um, and so we made a slight modification of that as, as well. And that was part of part of part of the, the revision to policy 1.10 and the creation of policy 1.12 as well. And again, that went through the same process with the Rules and Regs Committee. Um, they voted unanimously to, to present these to the full board, and so um, that's what we're doing today. Regarding the disciplinary action, as I read it um, a couple of times. It's more of a outline as to various steps in detail rather than generalities. So it's, it hasn't changed from what we've done in the past. It just kind of modified it and made it step by step. Correct. Um, the policy still remains that it's up to the board, the full board, to vote on any disciplinary, um, any disciplinary. Um, action that would, would be handed down. So it's still, uh, that power remains with the board, but it's, like you said, it outlines a little Step bit further step. steps, and uh, I, I feel like provides the board further options, you know, not just removal, but here's several suggestions that the board could take for a discipline. Where, where previously you really only covered removal. Correct. You didn't, you didn't talk about any options. I'll tune in just for a second on this as being part of the rules and regulations meetings. Um, I felt like there was a considerable amount of effort that went into this, and I was happy to see so much thought because it wasn't to me just discipline, it was also growth mechanisms for people and chances to come to clearer understandings. It wasn't just disciplinary in this and that, and that outline that Doug Impact has worked on to me showed a, a high level of of caring about the board members as well and their growth in the role and sometimes through the course of so much that's happening in, in the POA in the community uh, many many times it's an opinion or uh, an effort of an individual board member that may need called to attention 
uh, doesn't always result in needing disciplinary action as much as it needs further clarification and, and time spent. So I was, I was happy to see that those efforts uh, went, went in that direction. The comments. Um, I, if you, if uh, those of you who have not been on the Rules and Regulations Committee meeting, will find that there's a form uh, at the end of the thing that's uh, titled Misconduct Allegation Form. And that, that is uh, to keep uh, any uh, charge in written form, that it's got to be submitted. It's not just a, a griping thing, you know, where you come before the board and you say, uh, you know, Jerry Hover's been, you know, you know whatever, you know. Uh, so it's, it's, if someone has an, has an allegation to make that there was misconduct, they complete the form, and the form is submitted to the board of directors. So it keeps it at a uh, more documented level. You know, we know exa exactly what the, what the charge is, and we don't, we don't have to get involved in conversations during board meetings to, for clarifications and things like that before the charge is actually submitted to the board. I forgot what you did, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> My understanding is everything that's on this would still be in executive session. Yes. <clears throat> Except for the, the voting, or right. whatever the, whatever the, the outcome. outcome of that would be disclosed okay. as it passes. So. Any other questions or comments? So two quick things. Uh, so uh, Tim touched on this, the approval process. Uh, assuming the board uh, does not object, this would go forward at uh, next week's meeting. Uh, it would potentially be voted upon. Uh, if approved at that time, it would then go to next month's meeting. And uh, if it's approved uh, for the second month in a row, then it would uh, become policy. Uh, for property owners that are interested in, uh, in these changes, uh, proposed changes, they can go on to the VOA's website. If they go, uh, go to the governance section, they will see uh, where, where there's a, a tab that you can click on that says uh, policies under consideration or considered to be changed. And those, uh, according to Leah, are already available on the DOA's website. So if you'd like to get more information regarding these changes, you can go forward and then do the research on your own. Uh, one other point. Uh, because we're thinking about bringing it up at next week's meeting, it would behoove the board to take careful, uh, give careful consideration to this. And unless there are anything other than grammatical changes to get back to, to Doug and Tom uh, as soon as possible so that it, it can't be, if there are significant concerns and you haven't, those haven't uh, arisen today, then we know we can't, can't move forward at next week's meeting for a reading because those concerns, it would have to be presented back to the board again. Yeah, wouldn't that be correct? Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other comments? So we move to next week's board unless somebody has objections at a later time or changes. Uh, next up, Jerry uh, uh, can give us a, a little update <coughs> on uh, the arbitrary rating for development that he's been working on with a number of people. Okay, as far as the update on it, uh, we've had two meetings in the last several months uh, with uh, individuals from the community and the POA concerning uh, the establishment of an outdoor archery range. And as it stands right now, uh, we've looked at a number of sites and narrowed those down to uh, three separate ones that appear to be the, some of the best fit. And that would be one out near the current gun range, one off of uh, Nelly Road, and one on the very edge of the Arkmo property. Um, we now have, through the, the meetings, uh, a pretty good idea of what the needs are for both short-term and long-term. And now it's a matter of uh, bringing all the folks together uh, and ar arriving upon what kind of a design that we'd be looking at. Uh, 
and then moving it forward through the Recreation Committee. Myself, I'm a resource person to the Recreation Committee. The committee themselves are the ones that are taking the lead on this. Is there any questions? It's pretty brief. Um, Jerry, it's interesting. You said a word uh, as you were beginning your presentation uh, that I had never even thought about. Uh, you, you said outdoor ranges. Okay, is there any possibility, or is there any desire, to try to locate something within the confines of our current recreation buildings that might be used as an archery range for indoor shooting? You know, I don't even know if that's feasible. But uh, I was thinking, like, uh, let's say a um, uh, one of the handball courts. You know, some some something could be arranged where the handball court could be used for target practice, or something. Let's say at, at Reardon Hall. I, I don't know. You know, I'm just offering that as a uh, an, uh, asking if there was any thought being given to indoor shooting. At the present time, there's not any request for any further indoor facilities. They appear to have the. Uh, like the hook, line, and sinker has a, a course inside. Many of the schools have courses inside. The problem is they do not have anything outside. Okay. So that's why we're concentrating upon the outside rather than inside. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jerry, are we taking a step-by-step -step approach on this? And, and, and what I mean by that is uh, start small and go big. Or are we looking at uh, enough acreage as an example that you could do everything that you wanted by way of uh, an archery range uh, you know from from short range to longer range I, I don't know what it all involves at the current time we're actually looking at all all of the possibilities um, you know if we find a permanent site then that's a long-term uh, process but we may start with a simple uh, short uh, target range rather than including the uh, uh, field archery courses that would go with that. But part of it also depends upon uh, you know, if grants can be uh, obtained, then maybe we need to go for all of it. If uh, the group does not come together uh, and formalize everything, and it will probably bounce back to uh, the POA in budgeting for it in another year, two years down, down the line. So there's a lot of gifts in, involved in it yet. So the next meeting uh, will be uh, scheduled currently for March 16th. and try and put a few more of the dots over the I's and cross a few more of the T's. I'll tune in just a second on this, has been involved in a number of different archery discussions across the region and, and <coughs> having invested in the equipment and, and spent a fair amount of time at it myself. I, I, when I think of Bella Vista, in many ways, I kind of have almost the uh, Boy Scout manual in front of me because there are just so many great things you can do here. Of outdoor recreation and outdoor knowledge, and just growing up in this area, many of our scouting adventures happened at Bella Vista. And it kind of is surprising that archery hasn't been a part of the conversation up here, especially since it's one that you can continue to carry on throughout the ages. And I'm excited for Jerry's efforts here uh, to get something more formalized to offer as another amenity base here. I think it's actually going to be. Uh, a well-used thing and something that we'll see um, some considerable growth um, if we get something done. So hopefully it will take two years and I'm confident we'll find a location uh, this year. But I'm, I'm excited to see it come down. Thank you, Jerry, for working on it. Any other comments? Any other suggestions? Input? Thank you, Jerry. 
Okay, so the next one on the agenda is uh, planning for a lot sale event. Um, as you know, we have about 600 lots in our, that the PLA owns in our inventory, um, and a number of those are less than desirable for building or either steep or remotely located, so we, we had, don't have very good success in selling those lots. So what we're positioning for the last week of March is what we're calling, we haven't named it yet, we're still developing the, the plans for this, but it's a, a, a membership drive, um, something of the, that sort. I'm not the marketing person, but uh, as you know, if you own, to be a member of the, of the POA, you have to own property. So we're, we're hoping that we can push this and market this and sell, sell these lots that are you know, essentially not buildable uh, for, for membership. Uh, so that people can have access to the to the amenities, and we're looking at doing a, a blowout sale of, of, of a greatly reduced price, but so that we can entice people to be members of the POA and and use our amenities. So that's scheduled for the last week of March, and we're continuing to develop plans for that. So, anyone have questions about that? Small synopsis. Um, if you're if you're going to have this blowout sale, and you mentioned that the um, Lots are very uh, buildability, if you would. Mm -hmm. um, are you going to, when you have the sale, are you going to have a, a rating assigned so that, uh, let's say, a lot is fully un unbuildable mm -hmm. versus a lot that, that with significant engineering could be buildable, are some which are now readily buildable so that people, when they're coming forward to look at what stock is available, have some idea without having to travel out to the, the side of the lot before they... So so right now our, our lot sales website has a number of lots listed on it and it, sh it has um, instructions for you to go on the GIS county website and you can get elevations and see how steep it is. Um, I don't think we want to get in the, the rating system. We could open ourselves up to, you know, okay. that's, that's a subjective yeah. view. So, um, what we will do is put the list out sufficiently ahead of time that they can they can go on GIS and look at the lot and assess for themselves. Um, so you'll, you'll give suggest or rec you give a process by which they can get further information, correct. give their necessary references. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Jim has mentioned in the past that if it's a plotted lot, it's a buildable lot. It just depends on how much money you want to spend to right. to make it buildable. Yeah. Okay. But any of great value probably have been sold. <laughs> yeah, the ones the ones that you know are are, are buildable. David does a really good job of getting those sold and uh, presenting those. As the that. effective rating system for the lots, of course, is the price. If, if the price is <laughs> you know such and such that it's a readily build, buildable lot, that's different than a lot that pays little. You adjust the price. That's the rating system. Yeah, the, the two or three or four hundred that we make available through the sale will all have the same price, and it will be a very low price. We don't know exactly what that is yet. We're going to include, you know, it's going to include uh, deed preparation, recording costs. All that's going to be included. You know, the, what my department does, that all that all that cost will be included in the price, and then you know, so it's just a one flat purchase purchase price. One price shopping. Make it simple. And, and we're developing a process online right now, which is maybe more information you want to know, but how they can select a lot and, and pay for it right there online, and we can process their credit card and that type of thing. So we're moving through that whole system right now. Any other questions or comments? I'll pick the stuff, though. Okay, so uh, last week, uh, the uh, POA Water Department installed a water tap at uh, the Trafalgar Fire uh, site. Uh, now many people have come to us and said, well, well what does that mean? Uh, have, has the ADQ told the POA how they're going, planning on uh, uh, remediating the situation? And no, we don't, we don't know any more information than what the specifics are regarding what their needs for the water tap. So we decided, you know, so they gave us the specs installed um, uh, it to those spec specifications. 
we wanted to get it done as quickly as possible. I would much rather have the work finished and wait for the ADQ to actually start using it um, as opposed to ADQ being ready to go and waiting on us. So we moved forward very quickly and got that work done. Uh, and so it's ready to go. But uh, we're, I have not heard anything regarding what the specific plans are uh, for the use. Uh, the next item is uh, tentatively there is a community uh, informational meeting uh, set up for February 12th at 6 p.m. at Reardon Hall. Uh, this is the group that put together the last meeting uh, in December, I think it was, uh, early December, uh, is the same group that's putting on this meeting. Uh, so uh, uh, add that information to your calendar. We'll have that on the POA's calendar also. Uh, with regards to the other, we're kind of calling them the other stump dumps uh, uh, to differentiate from the from the Trafalgar fire location. Uh, on three of those locations, uh, these are the locations that are all located within the city the boundaries of Bella Vista. And they've, uh, one was closed over 10 years ago and the other two were closed over 20 years ago. Uh, those, all those sites have been uh, inspected by FTN, which is the company that uh, the POA hired uh, to do this work. And uh, they have submitted uh, letters uh, to uh, ADQ on uh, how to go about uh, closing, officially closing those sites in the eyes of uh, ADQ. Uh, those letters were sent off to uh, them last week, and uh, we hope to hear back relatively soon. Uh, regarding the West Side Stump Dump, FTN is uh, developing uh, plans and they anticipate uh, they'll have those plans done in a, about a month on how to officially close the west side stump dump, officially close in the eyes of ADQ. It's closed right now, you can't go and dump anything there, but in the eyes of ADQ, we're trying to get it officially closed. That one's gonna be a little bit more intense uh, on how to close it, and, but we're waiting for those results back from FTN. They will then have to go to ADQ for approval before we move forward with any uh, actions. Uh, I encourage everybody to continue to consult uh, with the city's website. Um, uh, we're, that's what we're doing is we're directing everybody to that site. Um, we received uh, yesterday, uh, actually I'm sorry, the day before, we received the uh, official results uh, where we uh, had hired a third party company to analyze the water quality to see if there was any issues with Lake Brittany and Lake Ann. Uh, we did this in uh, December. We had the city post that information to their website. We just got the second round of results. Those results are good also. Uh, and those were posted to the city's website yesterday. I sent off to Cassie and she uh, accommodated my request and posting it to the, to the website. So I encourage everybody to utilize the, web, the city's website for your source of information. Tom, would you address the reports we've had that the west side of Stump Dump is, has fires or is burning or anything? I know it's been looked into. Um, so uh, I received a, uh, an email from a property owner last week. Uh, they were very concerned that uh, the west side of Stump Dump may be on fire. We sent out uh, an employee within 30 minutes to, to look at it, uh, and it was not the case. Um, Speaking with the uh, engineers from FTN, it is steam uh, from the decomposition of the organic material that is there. Anything else? Any other questions? If not, we come to once again to the open forum where property owners have their right to speak for three minutes. We can entertain anybody. Nobody cares to speak to us? I do have a comment. John, go ahead and speak to us. Uh, thank you for your work on the uh, policy changes. When I saw that on the uh, agenda a few days ago, I quickly went to look and check about you know what the rules and regulations committee was done. And interestingly, I discovered they have not met for 18 months, according to the website. The rules and regs? Nope. 
March of 17 was the last time minutes were posted. We will get that fixed. And uh, Leah's year change hasn't showed up yet. And uh, a bit of a bitch on open meetings. I understand the rules and regulations for the meet in private as they did this week. But I find it hard to believe that anything that happens in that meeting rose to the level that it should have been in private meeting. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know that. Jim, it was not a, it was not announced as a private as a closed meeting, was it? It wasn't announced as anything. Well, isn't it then best best to assume that it's an open meeting unless it's identified as a closed meeting? The door said it was closed. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't look at the door. <laughs> Anyone else? Bruce, I I had. Uh, uh, Put something past uh, Tom the other day uh, relative to trying to ease the congestion uh, right here uh, between uh, the golfers and, and the users of the restaurant um, and and I appreciate Tom's reply to me uh, I was wondering if anybody else has any thoughts about uh, making more space available uh, so that we are not crowding each other out. I haven't heard of any complaints yet from you know, restaurant goers coming in and saying, hey, golfers are taking our spaces. We're trying to parking spaces. Parking, parking, space, space. If we um, know of an event in advance, um, uh, we'll, now the employees are required to park on the third level, on the upper level. Uh, with that being said, if there is a large event that we know is coming, uh, what we'll do is we will have the employees park at Tanya Creek and then we actually shuttle, shuttle them over. Um, with that being said, there's an occasional instance. We had one last week or the week before uh, uh, where it was a seminar on scams and that received an overwhelming response from the community and we were surprised by it. Uh, and the host was also surprised, and, and uh, uh, that maxed out the parking lot. We had a couple complaints. Uh, so when we when we can anticipate it, we try and uh, uh, make sure that we uh, move the employee cars because uh, that uh, reduces the number of spots or increases the number of spots available. The challenge we have is that we're landlocked, so we really can't add another level of parking. But there's definitely times that we could uh, use, especially on large shotgun events, uh, we have like a double shotgun and so forth. Over the summer, we have used, uh, if it's a long term or double shotgun, they have locked off the restaurant areas until it's time for the restaurant to open. And so there's definitely spaces for restaurant people on those days so people don't fill both sides. And that's usually out of town people who weren't aware that the restaurant is locked off off until 11 o'clock. Mike, go ahead. Well, I was thinking of you know, just customer service and is, is there, and maybe in the future, the summer when we anticipate great weather and, and the restaurant really humming and the golf course is really doing lots of business, uh, is doing some sort of valet service. Um, is he hearing Daryl's commentary about uh, handicap needs? I see the, the same. Uh, opportunity there to offer um, extended level of service. Let me follow up with, with Mike on that's kind of what I was thinking, and, and we can probably use a lot of my tanker because it's very full. And on those heavy days that we're, when we're anticipating a big tournament, uh, and, it's, and you're still going to have the employees park over there and shut them, you can shut them off or just like you can employees. Send, send a big car over there, bring their bags. I'd be happy to do that because it's, sometimes it's a lot easier to walk out of the stairs. Pick me up and drop me right in your park. So maybe if you advertise it that way, and you know, maybe valet park, somebody can you know, maybe pay 10 bucks to valet park your car. I don't know what we want to charge for it. To to we can figure out a way to make a buck. Why not? Let's remember Tom when he, when he opened the uh, 
restaurant a year ago, almost, I think it was April, uh, he said the striping that was done to follow up is, is a test. So the striping may be adjusted here as the year progresses. There may be less for restaurant or more for restaurant or vice versa. So far it seems to be working, but there are days that we run out. No denying that. Um, but, there, no, but as long as we have enough advanced warning, we can usually make adjustments. Oh, okay, that's fine. That's fine. I just uh, uh, I worry when uh, uh, a warmer spring and a hot summer is upon us relative to uh, what's going on here, the golfers, uh, the people who uh, want to partake of BV, bar and grill, et cetera, uh, could become problematic. And uh, uh, as David suggested, and we all know there's a huge lot down in Canyon Creek, uh, but I, I defer to you on the expense of actually running in, uh, a cart shack type operation out of, uh, out of Canyon Creek to accommodate golfers that want to park down there. And the expense and the, and the control, because how do you check them in and so forth. Um, the good news is we're talking about a good problem. Too many people want to <laughs> come here. It's a good problem to have. I'll let the IRB <laughs> Well, I, I blame you for being a board member. Oh. <laughs> Any other positive comments? <laughs> Susan. Um. So I was um, thinking about the report that has been requested, and I think it's a great idea. Uh, I mean, the one thing that I've liked about the golf report is the analysis, because if nothing else, it lets us know that you know what the members really said. And I think there will be much more interest and scrutiny on the, on the POA budget in the coming years because when you had $12 million or whatever it is in reserves, nobody cared. But as our reserves have fallen, there are more and more people who have an interest. And I think an executive summary type report of uh, what the monthly status is would be of great interest to a lot of members. Uh, the other thing is on the uh, policy, which I like, but it would be helpful if on the agenda maybe you could put a link to how you could get to the uh, information because I mean I go to the financials quite frequently and I still have to think about how it is that you get there. And if you're not familiar, you never find it. So just in the interest of transparency on that. Thanks. I think that's a good point. If you're only going to the website a handful of times and you're, you're looking for this, you, it would, we have. The good news is that our website has a tremendous amount of information. The bad news is our, we have a tremendous amount of information and trying to find what you're looking for can be a challenge. Any other? Go ahead, Jerry. I think Susan, you have to uh, talk just briefly on the longest day. Oh, okay. Much okay. Um, so um, I think most of you know that last year the uh, golf committee uh, approved a longest day tournament, um, and we held that tournament, and it, we raised about ten thousand dollars, and uh, that was the single largest uh, event that the longest day had in Arkansas. Um, and kind of as a result of getting involved in that, I'm now on the longest day committee. And um, so, what we're going to try to do this year is expand the breadth of the events that we have in Bella Vista. Um, we have a lot of people in Bella Vista that are impacted by Alzheimer's, either themselves or their family members. Um, serious disease, it's growing and it's gonna get worse in the short term. So uh, we're just at the beginning of the planning stages and um, so I just sort of, this sort of awareness um, that we're looking for people who might be interested in hosting events and, and they don't need to be huge events, these can be uh, you know, just a club day that you're doing something to raise money for Alzheimer's. Um, or a bike ride, or a kayak, or a paddle day, or a day at the beach, or whatever. So, and we have lots of ideas, but we need, uh, we'll be soliciting for people to organize and promote the events or volunteer at them. Because uh, we want to get our donations up from 10000 up to the $25,000 range. 
um, from Bella Vista this year. What date is it? Uh, the, the golf tournament this year is the 17th of August. The longest day is all centered around uh, the solstice, which I think is the 20 something of June, right? But the events can happen at any time. And uh, so um, we, we're going to try and contact club members and organizations and that kind of thing. And the, uh, the Alzheimer's Association will help with getting things like corporate sponsors, especially general corporate sponsors, as opposed to, you know, the kayak shop or the bike shop, right? But um, anyway, so I do, we just appreciate uh, support through, um, as uh, we do more publicity on it, and just want to make you aware that that's happening. Susan, when I know Siobhan has left the yeah. Alzheimer's Association, has she been replaced? Uh, they're, look they're looking for a replacement. They've interviewed a number of people. Uh, she has not yet been replaced, so uh, there are a few of us that are kind of carrying on in her absence. The uh, woman, uh, Carly, who does the walk, uh, is kind of filling in for right now. Okay. Okay, so we had a meeting with our executive director last week. So, thank you. Thank you. Any others? Any other comments, questions for the of the cause? If not, Regular board meeting is next Thursday at 6.30, the 24th. GM meeting for February is February 14th. Don't forget the chocolate. At uh, 2.30 in the afternoon is a closed meeting. The strategic planning committee is Tuesday, February 19th at 9 o'clock in the boardroom, and this also is a closed meeting. The work session is uh, two, Thursday, February 21st at 9 o'clock, and then the next board meeting for February will be the February 28th at 6.30. We stand adjourned.